Evening Standard Rugby Podcast with Lawrence Delalio. Hello and welcome to the podcast where we have all the news and views from round two of the Six Nations. Now, Steve Cording is off on his holidays, sunny Devon, I believe. So with me in the studio is the Evening Standard Rugby Correspondent, Nick Pruwell. Nick, great to have you finally in the studio. How are you? Thanks for having me, Lawrence. Yeah, very well. Thank you. How are you? Uh, good, good. Good, good. Long journey, I take it. Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. Just in from uh, Suffolk, so, you know, sleepy Suffolk first thing this oh. morning, but nice to see the sunrise on the train, so very good. Look at that. We moan in London <laughs> about getting around, and you're in from Suffolk. Well, <laughs> listen, it's uh, it's good to have you here. I'm sure we'll uh, we'll be hearing lots more from you. I know you want to talk to us about that game at Twickenham that you are at the weekend, but before we get stuck into that, let's welcome our special guest, um, I think I must have been missing Sarah's Welsh tones on this podcast as uh, following on from uh, Jiffy's appearance last week. We've got another rugby legend joining us from Wales with 87 caps to his name and a staggering 58 tries. Um, an incredible player. He holds the record as the top try scorer for his country. It's my good mate Shane Williams. Shane, how are you? Morning. I'm very good. I didn't realise I was going after Jiffy, so I've got a lot to live up to. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. He's uh, He was up there at the weekend. Um, I mean, Shane, just before we get stuck into the weekend's games, just just give our listeners a, uh, uh, an early memory for you of your first ever sort of Five Nations, Six Nations memories and 58 tries. That is an extraordinary record. You, you can't remember every single one of them, but you must remember one or two that were pretty special to this tournament. Yeah, rightly so. I My first cap was in the first Six Nations when Italy, Italy got introduced. Uh, my first game was actually, I came off the bench, played against France. Uh, and unfortunately, my first touch of the ball was an interception pass to Emil Intermac. So, um, <laughs> oh, no. I I remember that vividly, yes. Um, but, no, look, I, I, Graham Henry was coach at the time and uh, he put a lot of faith in me. I was very green, very raw and very new to the to the game, to be honest, at, the, at a senior level. Um, and he gave, me, he gave me the opportunity to start my first game the following week against Italy. And... I scored my first of of those tries and we won the game and you know the, that experience kind of made up for the week before. But I've had my ups and downs as has uh, Welsh rugby. But um, that's what the Six Nations is all about, really. Yeah, incredible. And uh, I guess you know playing for so long uh, across so many different teams. But obviously the I guess the purple patch would have been uh, you know that Warren Gatland, Sean Edwards combination and and so many great Welsh players. What what would you say? I mean, was it was it three, four Grand Slams that, that you guys won? Well, I, I, me personally, it was two, but they went on and, and won more championships and Grand Slams. Um, yeah, you know, they, they came as a package, and, and what a package that was, really. Uh, they took over in 2008 after an awful World Cup for us where we got knocked out to the group stage by Fiji. Um, but what Warren came with was was confidence. You know, he he would speak to the lads individually, make them feel, you know, that they were world class players, and he would do it collectively. And by the time the Six Nations started, he made us believe in ourselves again. And um, and sometimes that's just the difference, you know. That Laura is just, yeah. you know, that how how your man managed and how you looked after sometimes is a difference because, you know, the the level between a, a, a brilliant Six Nations player and a good Six Nations is is an inch. It's not it's not much at all. So it's just how you manage that. And um, he he told us we go to Twickenham, beat England, who were probably the favourites to win the championship. That we would go on to win the Grand Slam. Um, we all thought he was bonkers, um, <laughs> but you know, he, uh, but uh, we went on and done that. You know, so we were scratching our heads at the start, but it just gave us huge confidence. And then. When he comes with the likes of Howley, who he'd worked with before at Wasps, and and of course Sean Edwards, who brought in this um, brand new defensive set where it was blitz defense, pretty much like in England's defense on on Saturday, where you just rushed the the attack inside. Um, you know, it's it, it was it was high risk, high reward. Um, you know, he, and I remember Sean Edwards telling me, Shane, you're going to lead this defense from the outside, and I was like, hold on, Sean. I'm 70 kilos soaking wet. <laughs> you know, if, if I'm leading this defensive set, it's not going to be very scary, but it, it, it worked. You know, we, we just, we only conceded a, a couple of tries in that Six Nations and uh, and that's really what won us the championship. Yeah, fantastic. And <clears throat> it's fair to say that that combination also 
made sure that every team that they coached uh, had a lot of fun as well. And uh, talking about fun, let's have a chat about this weekend's games. Um, just to remind everyone, we'll start with uh, with England Wales. Nick, um, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, Warren Gatlin came here in in bullish mood up to Twickenham. I think you know, believing that his Welsh team could could upset the odds, um, and I suppose they had the momentum having come back from. Um, you know, so many points down against Scotland. England, a winning start, but uh, but but still with plenty of questions to answer. I mean, it was a, it's fair to say, a chaotic first 20 minutes for England. Two yellow cards. They gave away a penalty try, but they also scored a try whilst they were down to 13, you know, men. We had the George Ford, uh, you know, char- charge down <laughs> yeah. conversion. We had yeah. about 58 scrums <laughs> that needed reset setting. So uh, what, what was your overall take on the, on, on the game? I think um, England are, are obviously uh, in, still in big transition, and that's a state of flux that needs to finish soon. Really, and they need to get settled. But they're, they're doing it, desperately doing everything they can to get to that point. But I think it's a decent start, two wins. Um, I think, as we've talked about, they need one more, don't they? Really, for it to be progress in this in this in the next three games. The match itself very messy. They're still making a lot of sort of almost cheap errors just as they're trying to bed in new systems in attack and defence. Yeah. Um, but they got over the line. They had the experience in the now just for a couple of players, just to put their foot on the ball almost in the football parlance and, and just, just see them through. I mean, I was a bit of a grumpy old man after the game. I wrote a piece for the <laughs> Sunday Times saying that rug, rugby's a tough watch. Sometimes it's get, getting a little bit, it can be a bit boring. And I don't want to point the finger of blame anywhere, but uh, we had a game that went on forever. Uh, there were scrums yeah. that were taking way, way too long to set. Um, and, you know, whether that's the referee's fault, the player's fault, you know, fans are getting bored. Mm. We had TMO decisions that took a long time. We had a player sent to the sim bin that I didn't think deserved to be sent to the sim bin. I mean, am I am I the grumpy old man, Shane, or or, or, or is <laughs> do, do is rugby still trying to work out what it's what it is? Because you know, I watched the, I watched yeah. half the Super Bowl last night, and uh, and admittedly, you know, that's a game that goes on forever. But they they don't half arrive at decisions quickly uh, when they have to make them. <laughs> uh, yeah, look, it, it, yeah, I, I completely agree with you because you know when you, when you're a co-commentator as well, and you know there's there's a number of scrums there, and each scrum <laughs> takes about five minutes. To, <laughs> to, to, to be set and and reset and etc. And you've got Ben Case set, sat next to you rubbing his hands thinking this is fantastic. And I'm thinking, Jesus, i got better places to be. Do you know what I mean? Um, you run out of stats. It, it you is, run it, out it, of it, stats to talk yeah. about. <laughs> it, it, it's an, it is. And, and you know, if, I, if I'm feeling that, um, you know, what are the crowds and, and what are the people watching on the telly thinking? Um, yeah. Completely agree. There's enough, there's enough kind of uh, referees, TMOs, um, working behind the scenes, linesmen to kind of get surely to get a scrum set and get the ball out and get the backs flowing like we all want to see. Let's mm. be honest, most of us want to see. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. To, out there, you know. Um, I, of course, the game has got to be safer, and and I'm an advocate for that. You know, and head-on-head head collisions. Yes, we want to kind of get that out of the game, but they do happen. Um, I think you know there are accidental clashes of heads or contact with a head and. Yeah, you know, uh, Chester would have been would have been unlucky because the 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 angle of of the contact and the height of yeah. Azarati when he was falling. I'm thinking, you know, this is really harsh, but the law says head contact uh, warrants a sanction. So that is where we are at the moment. I think we are going in the right direction. We are making the game safer, um, and and I'm all for that. But the, we're not quite there yet, do we, Lawrence? And I think, yeah. you know, we, we want it to be fun. We want it to be um, a spectacle for the supporters. They pay pay a lot of money to come and watch these games. Yeah, and we don't want to be sat around for four or five minutes just <clears> waiting <throat> for a decision yeah. to be made. There's yeah. enough people there now to be making that decision in in seconds. Yeah, I just yeah. think the game is. Uh, I couldn't agree more. The game is guilty of sometimes over analysing itself. You know, either the referee make a quick decision and stick with it, or if the if the referee wants to go to a TMO. You know, don't be afraid to overrule him. Make the right decision, but get on with it so that we can get on with the game. Now, listen, our QBE predictor last week forecasted wins for Wales, France and Ireland. So was correct on two out of three of those. But had the, uh, talk about TMO decisions, had the final referee decision up at Murrayfield gone a different way, then we'd have seen victory for Scotland. There's been a lot of (laughs) post-match chats. Um, whether or not the ball was grounded. Uh, Nick <laughs> Berry, the referee, who was about as close to the action as you could get, gave the on-field decision of held up. 
And there seemed to be a bit of confusion from uh, Brian McNeese, who initially suggested that he could see the ball on the ground, but then upheld the referee's decision. <laughs> I mean, it, it's almost as if uh, we're getting ourselves tied in knots here, really. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm going to go with, with you, Nick. Well, what are your thoughts on that? And I mean, I guess if you're a Scotland fan, uh, you feel like you were robbed. Yeah. Um, and yeah. if you're French, um, you'd think for once the decision's gone your way. I think if you widen this out and, and look at rugby more more broadly, there's there's a there's a problem with the sport at the moment and the the, the, the governance and the governors of the sport where a lot of people are, are patting themselves on the back prematurely with changes to the sport and celebrating the results of things that haven't happened yet. Talking about opening the game up, making more access, allowing Netflix in, you know, for the behind the scenes access is great but it wasn't actually the access in some quarters wasn't actually as wide as they wanted it to be and if it really was then it would have been oh, better listen, you know, mean, was, any, anyone who's congratulating themselves for that documentary this series is the, this is the thing because it, 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 it was poor and, and needs to be better well, the, the same simply. thing the same thing with the, the premiership documentary it started at the playoffs and it skipped over Worcester and Wasps and it didn't discuss London Irish at all yeah. now there's no context so if you're not a fan you don't, you, you don't learn anything you don't understand so I understand why they're trying to do these things and they are the right things to do the ideas are there the execution isn't yet and it's exactly the same when we see things like this on the field because you've got a referee talking to someone in a porter cabin and every, all the officials concerned are scratching their heads. Yeah. Players are getting cold, scratching their backsides, to be quite honest, wishing something <laughs> was happening. And like we said before, we all, we've all been in that situation. Anyone who's played rugby knows that if you are going to score a try, it's the, you know, the onus is on the person with the ball to, to demonstrate a clear grounding. And if you haven't done it privately, obviously you wouldn't be saying it outly, but you'd be fuming with yourself for yeah. making that mistake. And... In decisions are made back in you know before technology. Everyone would have just got on with the yeah, d- decision, wouldn't they? So they have to find a way to get back to that point of quick decisions that nobody is going to grumble about afterwards. And so the balance is skewed the wrong way at the moment. It's I understand why they want to do it this way, but it, some of the discussions almost feel like a court of law, yeah. and it's supposed to be an entertaining sport. You know whether or not it was a try at the end. I'm not really not going to get into that, but. You know, for, for me, it's, you know, a referee should should literally go, I have no idea if that was a try or not. What do you think? Rather than, I didn't think it was a try or I saw the ball ground. It's, it just confuses matters and it just, you know, again, yeah. just by asking that question sometimes, it, take, it it makes the decision longer to be to be made as well. But deservedly, I thought Scotland were the better team. Um, so they will be hard done by. And uh, you can see, just see in Townsend's eyes afterwards where, he realised that they should have won that game. Uh, he was confident and celebrated winning that game, and then it was all snatched from him. Which again took another five minutes out of the out of the game. I know it was at the end as well, but you know the Scots were ready to celebrate, weren't they? And they and they had five minutes to wait, and then were drowned in their sorrows, unfortunately. So, yeah, I it, it's yeah Scotland. I, I felt for Scotland, I really, really did. And if they'd have won, you know they they'd have been up there with Ireland and really competing for the honours, but. Um, it, wasn't to be. Now listen, it's yeah. a fallow week ahead for the teams. Now Shane, uh, I mean this tournament, I played in the Five Nations because I'm ancient and it was <laughs> and it was available in Betamax video. You, you, you made your debut in the Six Nations but it's now played over a, a condensed period of time. It used to be a lot longer. We used to bemoan the fact that there'd be a couple of weeks. We used to go back to our clubs and play two games in, in between the tournament. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, how, how do you think those did you enjoy having a week off in between international matches or would you say, look, we need to just get this tournament done and dusted as, as quickly as possible? Because there is a balance between player welfare. You know, we saw a World Cup that went on for nine weeks uh, because they were trying to put rest periods in for the players. It, it felt like it was too long. This tournament is seven weeks. You know, is it too long? Is it too short? Where, where do you sit on that, Shane? Well, as a spectator now, you know, I'd, I'd love to be seeing international matches every week. And that's me being selfish. Um, I do kind of remember looking back. It, it depends as well, because a lot of players will, will play every every Six Nations match, yeah. um, especially in this day and age, you know, when you're trying to establish your, your first teams and your combinations, etc. Um, so looking back when, you know, I usually played in every match in the Six Nations, I was quite relieved um, after an encounter like like they had on Saturday up in Twickenham, which was very physical. 
Um, it, you know, it, there was a lot of errors, so the game was very open. There was a lot of kicking, you know, a lot of lot of ground and mileage covered. I imagine, I'm sure the players would um, would be looking forward to, to to an extra week, really, where even though you know you, you haven't got a game, it's still going to be difficult. You know, you you, you have your your easy period at the start of the week, and as the week goes on, you know, you get your bone on bone contact training sessions. You know, the intensity is is raised as the weekend comes because most of the team won't be going back to their their regions or clubs, um, and there'll be players as well that they'll have the opportunity to go back to their regions and clubs that haven't played much rugby as well. So, so it's nice for them to have that opportunity because as a player that doesn't get selected much in the Six Nations. If you don't go back and play for your clubs, it, it like you say, it's a set it's seven weeks without rugby, isn't it? So, um, I I I see how it benefits um, benefits both sides of it, really. But yeah, I to be honest, from for me, I was I quite looked forward to that extra week where I could recover and uh, and tape myself back up, put all the plasters back on and, and get ready to go again. Well, listen, Shane, I, I agree. I, I think we should just now have a block of Six Nations games and just get them get them over and done with and and, and, and enjoy them. You know, what, to have to sort of, uh, you know, it's like leaving a restaurant halfway through a meal and going to another restaurant. Isn't it? We, <laughs> why, why would you do that? And, I, and listen, we're going <laughs> to... We're going to look ahead to round three in more detail in next week's podcast, but just to give you an overview of what's to come and what our QBE predictor has forecast the scores to be for the next round, round three of Six Nations Rugby. Uh, this is how the predictor works. Our friends at QBE Insurance have simulated the tournament 10,000 times, producing outcomes from 150,000 games with every match replicated by generating a number of tries, conversions and penalty scores by each team, along with key analysis from their actuaries. And so far, I think they've predicted five out of six successfully. So, Shane, they've predicted Ireland 25, Wales 16, Scotland 23, England 22, wow, and France 45, Italy 15. So they've gone with three home wins. I guess, Shane, after... Ireland battered Italy 36-0, 25-16. I mean, is that realistic? Would you take that now as a, as, as a buyer of insurance? <laughs> yeah, I'd take that, <laughs> wouldn't you? Um, <laughs> yeah, look, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fearful of this game. I really am. Um, I'm hugely impressed how, how Ireland are playing the game. Um, you know, even, even on Saturday, even though Italy didn't score a point. They didn't play poorly, Italy. I thought they had a real go. I thought they kept the ball really well, just massively frustrated by a well-organised defence. And even in attack for Ireland, Ireland had to work hard, really hard for their tries. It wasn't as if they were scoring 78 yarders untouched. You know, they really, they, they're going to play through 20 phases plus easy Ireland. That's how they do it. And they grind it down. They get line outs five metres from the line and and, the, and like we, we go on about, you know, the hooker, Sheehan, is going to become the all-time top try scorer ever for uh, international rugby. That's that's how they work. And yeah. and so they made yeah. Italy look quite poor. Uh, but I was quite impressed with it, with Italy. So it, it may be the same thing for Wales out there. What is success for Wales in this tournament for you? Not, not necessarily against Ireland, but but obviously they mm. they could go... You know they could lose another couple of games and then and then have to beat Italy to uh, you know to get their first win. But but what does success look like? Because they are making progress and Warren Gatland called for patience yeah. ahead of this Ireland game. Yeah, hundred percent, Lord. I think um, I I think Warren Gatland would be happy if they continue their progression. If if they 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 look like they get they're getting more organised, that they get in their the game plan together. I, I'm under no illusion. I don't think we'll win out in Ireland. I, um, but there's two home games after that. It's certainly, this French side aren't as scary as they were in the World Cup. Um, and without Dupont, they're not as scary or, or as intimidating. So I think Gatlin will, will target that match. He really will. And, and, and I believe that is a game in Cardiff they're capable of winning. Um, and then obviously, Italy last. And if you've just beaten France, then you should go on and beat Italy. So if if Warren Gatlin comes out to the Six Nations having won two games, I um, and there's a progression there, and people can see that. Um, I think he'd be relatively happy with with what he's done in the Six Nations with such a young squad. Shane Williams is our man. Thank you so much for your time. Listen, enjoy the rest of the Six much. Nations, and uh, I look forward to catching up with you soon. Nick, thanks for coming into the studio. Thanks, Evans. Um, thanks Steve for me. can stay in Devon now for a few <laughs> yeah. more weeks, uh, keeping me uh, company. Uh, and my, also my thanks go to VoxPod Studios for hosting us so brilliantly. As always, thanks for you guys listening at home, uh, and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.